Okay, let's look at question 12 now. It says a 6 year bond with annual coupon payments at 7% annual coupon rate and 8% yield to maturity. It is selling for 95.37% of par. What are the annual payments on $1,000 par value? Now you can see that in this question, a lot of information are given to you. But actually, if you look at the question carefully, they are asking you for the annual payments on the $1,000 par value bond. So essentially, they are asking you about the coupon payment. All right? And in the convention of bonds, right, a coupon is always expressed as a percentage of par value. So if the par is 1,000, 7% of 1,000 will give you a coupon rate of $70 per year. So the answer without looking through too much is actually option B, $70. Alright, this is the interest that they will pay every year on this bond. Alright, so in the exam, be very careful what is the question being asked. Alright, do not just go and calculate all the net numbers because you may not need it. Okay, now to go through a bit of a revision on bonds. Alright, remember that the value of bond okay, is always expressed as the present value and it's a function of all the future cash flows as expected of the bond. Uh, this is the reason why we call it a fixed income instrument because you know the future value of all the income in the future. What is the value of the coupon plus the maturity value? All right. So the value of the bond is essentially the discounted total value of all the individual cash flows. All right. So the formula basically is the first year coupon divided by 1 plus i, which is the yield, to the power 1, plus the second coupon, 1 plus i to the power squared, plus the third coupon, 1 plus i cubed, plus all the way okay, to the final end coupon over 1 plus i to the power n. Right? And of course, this bond will always mature at par, so you always need to add on the par value. All right? So in TVN calculator, remember this. All right? This is always your PV. Okay, the coupons are always your PMT. We are assuming that we are dealing with our fixed rate coupons. Okay? Now, what happens if the coupon rate is not fixed? All right? Then you cannot use this formula you'll probably be using your cash flow um, mode in your calculator. Okay, This i is actually your u, okay? so it's your i in your calculator. And this is actually your n, and the par value is your fv. So same thing with pv, all right, n, i, pmt, and fv. Any of these five variables, all right, as long as 4 is given to you, you can always solve for the missing one. All right? And in the bond computation, the most common type of questions you'll be asking you is to calculate either the fair value of the bond, which is in this case a PV, or the yield to maturity or the yield to call. All right, because par value is always fixed, and the coupon rates in uh, the context of the CFP program is also fixed, okay, because we are not doing with uh, variable rate bonds. Okay, so just take note of that, all right? Okay, now let's look at question 15. It says here, a measure of how well the returns of two risky assets moving together is the range, covariance, standard deviation, or semi-variance. Alright, now if you understand the definition, you will definitely know that uh, when we talk about the relationship of how two risky assets move together, it is the covariance. So the answer definitely is B. Okay, now let's look at what are the other options. Alright, range is what you have in statistics, basically the largest sample minus away the smaller sample. It is the difference between the largest and the smallest range, all right? Now, standard deviation, on the other hand, measures the risk, all right, or the uncertainty of how far, basically, a data moves away from the mean, okay? So, this is something that measures variation or risk, okay? So, it doesn't tell you, in the context of this question, how two risky assets move together. Semi-variance is very much similar to your variance. However, semi-variance has to do with measuring the downside. All right? It is said that in investment, right, some investors are not interested in the upside uncertainty okay, because you are more concerned about managing the downside. So basically, semi-variance um, provides a measurement for that. Okay? So what about covariance? All right? Covariance, actually, if you remember, is actually the measurement that measures how to risky assets move together. So if we have positive covariance, okay, then we say that A and B move together. Right? If we have negative covariance, then we say A and B move opposite okay, direction. If covariance is zero, then there's no 
inhalation. And typically, it is probably due to a uh, risk free asset with some other risky securities in the market. Now, covariance tells you the extent of how two risky um, assets move together, but the problem with covariance is that it's just an absolute number. Okay, if you look at the formula for covariance, the covariance of two assets, one and two, is actually the correlation between asset one and asset two multiplied by standard division of asset one times the standard division of asset two. Okay. So although it tells you the extent of how two risky assets move together, it doesn't tell you anything more than that. Okay, and the problem with COV is that because it is actually an absolute number, you can't actually put in a proper measure to say how strong is the relationship, which is what you actually want to understand in terms of portfolio design. All right? So we often have to use this term called the correlation, okay, which is actually your R. Okay, or the row, sometimes you call it. And the correlation, if you can see based on the formula of COV, it's just a matter of bringing the terms over. It's the covariance of the two assets multiplied by, uh, divided by the standard division of the two assets. So what you have here is essentially a relative measure. Okay, and this tells you the strength of the relationship okay so if your r correlation is positive one it is the highest positive correlation that means in terms of how these two risky assets move together it is positive and it has the strongest relationship if the correlation is negative one okay it also has the lowest relationship or the strongest inverse strength that means if asset a goes up by 10 percent asset b will go down by 10 percent now, in portfolio design, you always want correlation with, uh, you, you always want your portfolios to have low correlation, okay, and the lowest you can go is negative one. Of course, we know in real life, it is impossible to get a negative one correlation, okay, this is a mathematical theorem, okay, but the key here is you want to get the lowest possible, okay. So basically, this is the explanation and the revision that you can go on for covariance and correlation. Okay, always remember these two formulas because you may be tested on it. Okay, now if you want to move another step further to prove, all right, what is the standard deviation of uh, two assets moving together and how is the relationship like in terms of correlation? Okay, then you can use this formula. Okay, the standard deviation of two assets. All right, in the portfolio is actually the square root. Eh? Okay, I will just put this as a bracket first. The weight and the standard deviation of the first asset plus the weight and the standard deviation of the second asset, square both of them, plus the two times the weight and the standard deviation plus the correlation of the two asset, and then you square root it. Okay, the square root of a number is to the power of half. Okay, that's why I put a 0.5 here. Of course, you can always put a square root sign if you want to. Okay, now, to remember this relationship that we have covered actually in class, we look at this term in terms of the correlation. And we say that if the correlation is positive 1, what's going to happen is that this entire term here will become a positive number. And a positive 2 constant will always result in a overall larger number. And if you square root a larger number, okay, you get a higher standard deviation. This is mathematical proof that if you have a correlation of positive one, okay, the risk in your portfolio is also the highest. Right? On the other hand, if you have a correlation of negative one, so your R12 is negative one, what's happening to this term here will be a negative two. You take a constant number minus two, it will give you the smallest possible number within that particular constant range, and the square root of it will give you the lowest standard deviation. All right? So if you want to basically um, have the lowest risk or you want to reduce your risk in the portfolio to the lowest, you want to try as much as possible to diversify them with correlations that are lowest. Okay, So that is the relationship. So take note of them. Eh?